Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Such is the state of the British news at the moment, we probably won't have time to talk about that. I don't know about you, but I can't um, see a homeless person at the moment without... <sighs> Thank you, my lucky stars, my life turned out the way it did. The, the cold is so unbelievable, so bone-shakingly bad. I've reached an age now where I feel it in my knees. No one ever warns you about this stuff, do they? The two things they never warn you about, the strange parts of your body that you never really gave a second thought to until they start aching as you move into your... Uh, in my case, the second half of my fifth decade. And the other thing they never tell you about is the stuff that never gets better. You know, when you're young and you get a twinge or a pain or some, some ache somewhere and you think, I wonder how long this one's going to last. When you get to my time of life, you start find, you find yourself thinking, I wonder if this is going to be one of the ones that stays there forever. This is going to be one of my permanent, yet more blank faces from my younger colleagues staring at me through the glass. This is going to be one of the ones that never gets better. You've got it all to look forward to. Trust me on that. Um, but it, it, it seems to me to throw into slightly stark relief a couple of stories about so-called fake beggars. Um, Torbay, uh, the rather lovely town of... Uh, in Devon, seaside town on the English Riviera, have started uh, sort of naming and shaming people they believe, some activists in town, to be fake beggars. And I just... Don't quite get that story. Not, not, not to go for blanket and immediate knee-jerk disapproval, but even if you are a fake beggar, it doesn't necessarily seem to me to be indicative of a, of a stable life if you've chosen to sit in a doorway off your biscuits on spice and sticking your hand out in the hope of picking up a few coins. We'll have a look at that story from all angles later in the programme. Do you know that picking a care home for a loved one is more stressful than buying a house or deciding where to send your child. We'll have a look at that as well. And um, after, as you may have heard Nick mention, a boxer died two days after winning a tough fight. I, I do, I, whenever it comes on the telly, I've noticed I turn it off if my kids are in the room, and yet I really like boxing. Is that a sort of hypocrisy or a cognitive dissonance at the heart of the entire sport that means if it was invented now, we probably wouldn't allow it? I don't know. But we begin, because I think we must, with Jeremy Corbyn. And... An admission that I think possibly yesterday I may have called it slightly wrong. I'm, I'm, I don't know that I'm comfortable, and I'm never comfortable, admitting that I've called things slightly wrong. I still think he was cherry-picking. I still think a lot of what the European Union has said to Theresa May will apply to Jeremy Corbyn. I still think the biggest emblem of the madness that we're currently inhabiting is held up by the fact that Jeremy Corbyn, who really, I don't believe... Um, wants to stay in the Europe. I think Jeremy Corbyn wants to leave the European Union. I think Theresa May wants to stay in it. And yet now, oddly, the bloke who wants his, has wanted to leave it for the last 30 years is moving the country closer to doing what the woman who's wanted to stay in it for the last 30 years is moving the country away from. Confused? You will be. So, looking at some of the coverage today, and, and you have to, I think, when you're doing Corbyn, and I know this from bitter, but also, of course, delightful experience, I can't really talk about Jeremy Corbyn without annoying absolutely everybody, even by my standards of occasionally deliberate provocation. It is incredible how I can't say anything about the fella without everybody coming up in arms. Yesterday I was, an, I was a Tory uh, MSM shill for suggesting that he might not be the Messiah and then of course the people who still think he is the Messiah think that I am um, uh, all, all, all manner of monster. But the coverage has to be seen in a pincer movement. I have, to th I have to look at what the Daily Mail are saying, then look at what the Times are probably the closest to a, a clear path, closest to objectivity, look at what they're saying, then look at social media to get an idea of what the left is saying, because the left isn't really represented in the mainstream media at the moment, not in, not in a meaningful sense. And the Mail is spooked. The left is... I think crossing its fingers. If, if, you're, if you're a Remain-wanting Labour voter, he hasn't done enough yet to persuade you that he's the man, but he's done enough to persuade you that he's the only one who might represent your interests. Is that fair? I think it is. The left-leaning or the Labour-voting Leave supporter is in many ways the most interesting element of this entire conversation, possibly the person Jeremy Corbyn has had in the forefront of his mind, possibly the description that applies best to Jeremy Corbyn himself, the Labour-supporting Leave, not voter necessarily, but the, uh, OK, how about the Labour-voting Leave supporter? People's Front of Judea? Judean People's Front. And 
the analysis of yesterday's speech, which has gone down well with the CBI, CBI have kind of come out and said, well, it's, if, if, it's what we said yesterday, isn't it? If you have to pick between the two positions, then the more spooked you are by the prospect of jumping off this cliff, the more drawn you are to Jeremy Corbyn's position, even if every other element of his political performance thus far uh, leaves you profoundly unimpressed. So here's the question. What do you think the plan is? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. Genuine question. I usually last about mm, fourteen seconds when I promise to try to do analysis rather than opinion. I love doing opinion. It's it's kind of my bread and butter, the strong opinion. But occasionally you have to realise that we're living in a world now where strong opinions, the strength of an opinion bears little or no relation to the knowledge or the learning that has gone into forming it. It's that Isaac Asimov line about democracy being at its weakest when we attribute the same value to an utterly ignorant but very loudly, strongly held opinion that we do to a calmly arrived at rational evidence-based position. Um, so occasionally I like to leave opinions at the door, largely when I haven't got a clue which way to jump, and that's where I am now on this. What is Corbyn up to? I, like Liam Fox's former chief advisor, believe that we are poised to trade in a metaphorical three-course meal in return for the prospect of possibly getting our hands on a packet of crisps at some point in the unspecified future. That is what the former chief advisor to the Secretary of State for International Trade will say today. Literally, that, I mean, that, that is, that is, in fact, he, did he say it last night? Anyway, that is his line, the crisps versus the three-course meal. That is, if you will, the, the opinion that has been arrived at after a lifetime of studying trade, understanding things, doing deals, um, poring over the fine detail of contracts, looking at what is possible um, as opposed to what is uh, dreamt of. He arrives at that conclusion. Then on the other side of the debate, you now have the opinion based on little or no evidence, but incredibly strongly held, that we will get, I don't know, we'll trade in a three-course meal for an eight-course meal with unicorn steaks and lots of fish. Uh, and why? Because I said so. And Corbyn just seems to me to be the most interesting player in this whole story now. That he seems to me to be either doing the thing that his supporters said he'd never do, which is pragmatically stroke cynically manipulating the political landscape in order to, 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 to get into Downing Street. Whatever he may believe about a customs union, about the single market, about the European Union, about the Irish border, about workers' rights, whatever it may be that he believes, it looks to me as if yesterday's speech was designed more to put a cat among the parliamentary pigeons for the Conservative Party than it was to speak to the nation. But I'm just two pairs, I'm just one pair of eye, eyes, although uh, obviously I've got the pair in the back of my head as well. I don't know what solace or comfort the half of the country that remains persuaded that we're doing something stupid is supposed to take from that speech. Rachel Sylvester has a brilliant piece in The Times today drawing the parallels between Corbyn and Rhys Mogg, which I really, really would recommend to everybody interested in, in, in the domestic political landscape at the moment. We have this curious scenario now, as I've described, where a bloke who spent his whole political life wanting to leave is emerging as the hero of people who want to remain, while a woman who spent her entire political life wanting to remain is now pretty much the last hope of the people who want to leave. But what is Corbyn doing? I, I, I think Theo Oshwood's been brilliant on this uh, over the month because we speak off air as well as on air and he, I have to tell you, has more or less described play by play what the Corbyn tactics would be depending on how the needle begins to move, how more evidence emerges, more reality bites about what our future might look like. So Corbyn will move ever closer towards a sort of softest of soft Brexits, possibly. I, and, and this, I think, is the point. These are the calls I want. People who think he will eventually say, let's call the whole thing off. Or at least come out in favour of a second referendum or a meaningful parliamentary vote. What do you think is happening? Uh, not, not what do you want to happen. We've done lots of that and we'll do it again. But what do you actually think Jeremy Corbyn is up to after yesterday's speech on Brexit, Labour leader, perceived rightly or wrongly as hard left, now the leader of choice for the Confederation of British Industry, it would seem. How the hell has that situation ever come about? What's the plan? 0345 60 60 
seven three. And how? And, and I, you know, I can't resist sticking something up the flagpole to see whether or not you're prepared to salute it. How how, how accurate is it to say now it's all about the people who are? whether reluctantly or not, being drawn into the Corbyn vote because they think he might be the last chance to stop Brexit. And I don't know what evidence you've got for believing that he's your boy. I really don't. I'd love to hear it. 0345 6060 973. What do you think the plan is? And what do you think of the man himself? Is he changing in your opinion? Is he growing? Is he diminishing? Is he staying exactly the same? And ultimately... Where do you think he wants to lead the country? What do you think Jeremy Corbyn is up to? I don't think, oddly, yesterday's speech had that much to do with Brexit. He, he ruled out the possibility of a second referendum, but I would add never say never. He knows that he will rely upon the belief among Remain supporters that he is their last chance, the Obi-Wan Kenobi, if you will, of staying in the European Union, and yet 30 years of fairly passionate... Um, opposition to membership of the European Union on the grounds that it's a capitalist club mean that you must have your fingers pretty tightly crossed if you're seeing him as the great white hope for Remain. So, cautiously, it looks as if what he did yesterday was the first real example of him doing that thing that his friends and foes alike all said at the outset he could never do, which was kind of putting power ahead of principle, prioritising getting into Downing Street above having a clear set of principles, a clear platform from which he refuses to budge a millimetre. There's one fine line free. Hurry up. There's lots of men on the board. I've got nothing against men, but I do quite like female voices as well. They tend to just spread the load a little. So if you are a, a, of the female persuasion, I'll, I'll put you through earlier. You can have a little bit of priority. Positive discrimination in action. Tom's in Islington. Tom, what's going on? Hi, James. How are you? Very well, mate. What's on your mind? Uh, I'm a leave... I'm a leave voter, funnily enough. Um, I voted Corbyn in the last election, first time I've ever voted. In fact, the the uh, referendum was the first time I ever voted in anything. Really? Um, and Yeah, it was indeed, yeah. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't say I'm this kind of archetypal leave voter at all. Uh, I, I voted for completely different reasons. It was me kind of sticking two fingers up to the man. That's how I felt it was anyway. Fair enough. To be completely honest, I, I hold my hands up now and I say, I got it wrong. Okay because of the principle, the things that I believe in more are kind of seem to be chipped away at the moment. Um, you don't find food Corbyn, banks uplifting like Jacob Rees-Mogg yeah. does, Tom. But from a Corbyn perspective, I, I, I see this as a political move. I, the, the thing is, the reason I don't kind of criticise him for it is because it doesn't feel knee-jerk. If it was a knee-jerk reaction, and this was something that was coming off the back of... Um, a lot of pressure from the media, or it, it oh, doesn't seem like that. That's a really thoughtful. Like he, that's really thoughtful. He, he doesn't look like he's just sort of we've seen what the Daily Mail are doing and, and decided that he has to do this in order to keep them happy, which pretty much exactly, sums up yeah. Theresa May's entire premiership. Exactly, and and, and to be fair, it, from, from from somebody who wanted to leave and to see how the land lies now, to then turn around and say, <laughs> if I had the same vote today, I would completely change my vote and say that I'd remain. Yes. Well, I, I, I still, and I know it upsets people, and I, and I do it knowing that I will upset them, but I, I, you can't start biting your tongue for fear of causing upset among people who should know better. I don't know how anyone can, can, can be in a position different from yours. You just say, look, I voted with this amount of understanding, knowledge, and evidence, yeah. and I voted X or Y, and now I've got this amount of knowledge, understanding, or evidence, and my vote would just be better. It would be stronger, because yeah. I know a lot more 100%. about it now. That's all. 100%. But I don't criticise anybody for who voted the way they did because we all voted with what I believe was what we believed in. And obviously, when things change like they have, people should have the right to change their mind. Now, if that is what well, I think David done, Davis said, if people aren't allowed to change their mind, it ceases to be a democracy. But that was exactly, David Davis yeah. version 1.0, not version 2.0 post Brexit. Yeah. Yes, so, it, it, so I, I, I support him a little bit more, I feel. Okay, here's my problem. Uh, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm a massive hypocrite, I think, because the thing that I retained, all through finding Corbyn supremely unimpressive, the thing that allowed me to retain a modicum of admiration for the man was his unbudgeability, the fact that he was in almost direct contrast to every other prominent politician of the last 20 years, someone who sticks to his guns. And I don't mean he's stubborn. I don't mean he refuses to change his mind when the facts change. I mean, he has a, a, a strong socialist, there's no getting away from it, worldview. 
uh, from which he would not be budged. And that is what I think uh, drew a lot of support towards him, particularly from the younger generation, but by no means exclusively. So I think I'm pretty sure I sat here 18 months ago and said this is absolutely ridiculous Labour won't govern for generations because Jeremy Corbyn mm -hmm. simply won't put in the hard yards that are needed to get mm -hmm. into power he'll be too busy talking mm -hmm. about Venezuela or protesting against uh, I don't know the, the closure of a well in Ulaanbaatar and I was a possibly right when I said that at the time but now he's changed now he would appear to be prepared perhaps to surrender his lifelong antipathy towards the European Union because he leads an essentially remain party and I'm going to criticize him for that as well which makes me a massive hypocrite right uh, in a way I think yeah. it's tough at least we're on at least we're on at least we're telling it like it is to each other today Tom it is. The problem is, it's a bit like when people go, now he's in the pocket of the CBI, or now he's on the side of business. But just because his argument falls in line with that doesn't mean that he's been led by them. He's not a puppet, is he? He's no, not, that's true. He's not been dictated to by these people. He's just expressing a view which... He, he says it's a Democratic Party, with the Labour Party is now. 65%, I think, is voted to remain. So why, is, why would he not represent that 65%? Because he needs a 35% on side to get over the line. And that, that in, in a nutshell, that is why politics is in such a mess at the moment, is that no party in the traditional sense can speak to all of its disparate parts. This, of course, was the great triumph of David Cameron's project to reunify the Conservative Party after the referendum. Tom, I'm, I, I'm really grateful to you for that. It's, it's um, an angle I hadn't thought of, um, the notion that because he isn't blowing in the wind, he's moved very slowly, he insulates himself slightly from the accusations of cynicism that could be very easily applied to other politicians. Vanessa is in Wokingham. Vanessa, what's going on? Okay, well, I have always been a fervent, passionate Remainer, I mean, almost to the point of being activist. Okay. <laughs> um, and I've always really also been very anti-Corbyn, not anti-Labour, because I feel I'm probably a socialist at heart. Really? Uh, but he was far too on the complete other spectrum for me to follow him. Plus, you know, I don't know, there's something about him I just can't... <laughs> Um, I can't believe you just said that. I was chatting to a mate about this, exactly this issue yesterday, and I do wonder whether we've all been slightly groomed. Because e even, if, even if you are, in your own words, you know, a staunch Remainer and a bit of a socialist, the, the diet of, of coverage of Corbyn that we've all been exposed to might have just sowed these seeds. Go on. He reminds me of the kind of guys I went to school with, who, mm. I mean, because I'm, you know, of an older generation, but... <laughs> Um, who are who used to wear corduroys and like tweed jackets and be left wing and totally argue about communism and then you know I'd say well why don't you go and, I mean I shouldn't say that because I've been told to go and live in Europe if I don't like yes. but you know what I mean go and live in Russia the the yeah. origin of the phrase champagne socialist oddly and as with most things um, uh, from this sort of side of politics the people who use it the most haven't got a clue what it means was actually what you've just described it wasn't the fact that they were drinking champagne that was egregious because the champagne at the time in the in the circles that we're describing wasn't considered to be the luxury drink that it is now it was the fact that they were sitting around drinking and talking to each other that made yeah. them champagne socialists rather than going out there and starting the it's revolution. Sort of like so, echo chamber, yes, like exactly. So we could call them Darjeeling socialists or Earl Grey <laughs> socialists in the in the current yeah, climate. That's yeah, that's what it yeah. literally means. Well, that's that's what you might think of. However, yes. but and also because I feel in such despair, having no party that I feel I can align with. I did join the Lib Dems, but to be honest, I I just wanted to cry every time I went to a meeting because oh. it was like talking. And I know, I know that. <laughs> Um, but, the, you know, I just felt with this, because, you know, if you're such a passionate Remainer and I've lived in Europe and it's done me, I've had a great time in it and I want it to continue for my children and my yes. grandchildren, I feel maybe maybe because I want a glimmer of hope, but somehow his stance, he's not a stupid man. You know, he's seen, maybe he's seen the Don't light. bite my head off. Are you sure he's not a stupid man? Uh, well... Well, I mean, he wouldn't have got where he got to if he was, surely. Ian well, Duncan Smith okay. led the Conservative Party, Vanessa. Yeah, I take that back. I take that back. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but I don't think he is, because he speaks with conviction. Plus, he has his heart is in the right place, I believe, even if his politics might never not be aligned. I, do you know what I'm hearing? I'm hearing exactly what I described in my introduction. I'm hearing someone who wants it to be true. You, what, he's he, he's yeah, Obi-Wan Kenobi and you are Princess Leia, Vanessa. That's where we yeah. are this morning. Thank you. Thank you. But also, also, I think that 
you know, he needs money to get his socialist uh, policies through. And he can do that apart from maybe the nationalisation thing, but he's got to get his head around that because I don't understand that. Because of the SNCS, you know, Renta, Bundesbahn. I mean, how do they get away with it if we, if he thinks he can't? You mean state was... intervention or state aid? Yeah, uh, it, 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 yeah I'm not going to try and answer that because I'm not fully across it myself yet. Either. No, no. But I, I think they're state subsidised, they're not state wholly owned. But, you know, he maybe that was his sort of thing to say, oh, that's why I'm not so innovating for the EU, even though I think it's deeper than that and it has very left-wing... Marxist even maybe so that. in summary because I've, I've got to hit the news you are hopeful that he's moving in the direction you want him to yeah. move in and in the absence of anybody yeah. else even looking like they might be that's probably yeah. enough to bring you on side uh, yeah definitely and, and then you know you've got more than 65 percent haven't you if you've got the remainers who wouldn't trust him before maybe a little tired of that will push him over the line what do you think well we shall see and then of course we've got the council elections coming up in may which is what much of this positioning and agitation is truly about even though none of these people giving speeches say so and that and that will see that will uh, see just how scared the horses are vanessa thank you very much indeed are you sure he's not a stupid man you just wouldn't say that about any other politician james why do you feel entitled to continually insult him? It's tedious, James. Stop it, please, says Sam. Mate, it's a question. Are you sure he's not a stupid man? And if you were listening to the same radio programme I was presenting, it was followed on by saying Ian Duncan Smith got elected leader of the Conservative Party, i.e. really stupid people can end up leaders of parties in this country, Sam. So, come on. Grown-ups. Um, this is interesting. I don't know if this is true. I think it is. Corbyn said he would make decisions based on the party and the needs of the country, not on his own opinion, thus keeping Trident despite his professed hatred of it. And James says, Trish, in Highgate, I love your show and agree with you most of the time. What a clever woman. But you are, were the biggest Corbyn naysayer. You used to bash him as a sport, and now you say maybe the coverage of him was biased, uh, has biased us against him. Mate, you were part of that coverage. I'm just a little boy from Kidderminster, Trish. I, I blow in the wind like everybody else does. I find, found, find, found, find, I found him profoundly unimpressive. I find him, well, I'm like the Lars, I'm like Vanessa. I, 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 if, if we are going to stop the country from hurting itself so, so badly, and look, I live in London, I'm well paid and I'm middle class. I, most of the economic projections of Brexit will hit me least... It's quite a strange position that a lot of southern middle-class Remainers find themselves in. They're speaking up for people they think are going to get butchered, and a lot of the people they're speaking up for are turning around to them and calling them horrible names. But I... I don't... I, I, yeah, all right, I'm in a bit of a mess on this one. And, and like Vanessa, I'm, I'm kind of preparing to hold my nose and close my eyes if he is the Obi-Wan Kenobi of Brexit, if he is our last hope. Adrian's in Ealing. Adrian, what do you think? Well, I, I was quite entertained by your last little speech there, James. That's, that's the general idea, Adrian. Thank you. <laughs> well, well, yeah. well, I mean, um, well, you're doing a good job, James, but I think um, other than some rhetoric and trying to get the calls, the line's uh, buzzing. I think um, I, I can take you at face value. Well, don't let me insult you any James. further. Don't let me insult you any further by taking the call that you feel you've been somehow provoked into making, mate. Yvonne's in Holsworthy in Devon. Yvonne, what would you like to say? Oh, hi, yeah. Um, well, I don't know whether it's true or not, but my understanding is that um, if we joined the single market, the EU would stop any nationalisation, which I think is what Jeremy Corbyn it's wants not, to do. It's not quite that, because you, no. you, you know that our railways are owned by foreign governments from China yeah. to Germany and back again. I think it's more to do with state aid. So if a company is actually failing, then... Imagine if you've got a German train manufacturer and a British train manufacturer, and the British train manufacturer is going to go under. I think you have to have a full and open uh, competition process. So the British government can't say, well, we're going to give this contract to that British manufacturer, even though, by all objective comparisons, that's the worst offer but because it's a British company with British workers, we're going to give them the money. I think that's the rule of being in the single market, is that there has to be a, a, an equal and level playing field for all commercial competitors. But I promise you that if I'm wrong about this, I'll, I'll be the first to say. So it's not so much right. that we can't re-nationalise, it's more about state aid. But he seems to be moving a bit on that as well, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, like I so said, that's, that's what uh, me and my husband were thinking, that that's why he... Um 
isn't interested in the single market but was quite happy to go to the customs union because that would um, make it easier. The customs the union is, is an outward looking organisation whereas a yeah. single market governs what happens within a, a, a yeah. kind of a kind of bordered place. Where, where are you then and possibly your husband as well on the Corbyn question? Um, oh, uh, <laughs> wasn't expecting that. Um, what do you mean you weren't expecting that? That's the whole point of the programme, Yvonne. <laughs> well, I agree with him about the customs union. I'm not sure about the single market, though. But definitely, I think we should stay in the customs union. Do you know who else thinks we should stay in the customs union? Who? Have you heard of Dr Fox? Uh, yeah. The Secretary of State for International Trade. He will give a speech later today in which he will say that staying in a customs union is a complete sellout of Britain's national interest, Yvonne. But yeah. do you know that if you were to go to his website, and frankly I dig around in these corners so that you don't have to, you'd find that this is still up there, written in 2012. I believe that the best way forward is for Britain to renegotiate a new relationship with the European Union, one based on an economic partnership involving a customs union and a single market in goods and services. Mm. It's almost as if he's done a 180 degree about yeah. turn and not admitted to it, but left the evidence on his own website for little people like me to discover. <laughs> Good times. Yvonne, take care. Mark's in Hitchin. Mark, the Corbyn question. What's your answer? Oh, my, well, my answer is I think he's done a blinder both uh, politically and with that speech. I mean, he's basically stood back all this time, let the Conservatives fight out in the open, basically dug themselves big holes that they're all falling into. Yeah. I mean, you know, from that point of view, you know, he, I hate to say this, but he's, t he's taken a, a lesson from history, from good old Napoleon. He, he, really? You know, Napoleon always said, never interrupt your enemies when they're making a mistake. Oh, well, that's and a rather good line. Like that. Yeah, but, it, but it's, it's a brilliant one. They've stood back, they've let the Tories pull themselves apart. I mean, you know, it, it, he, that speech, it was all things to all men, unless you're a hard Brexiteer. He's given, you know, a port for that ship called the uh, Amendment from the uh, Tory rebels to land itself so they could go quite happily vote with Labour on that amendment. And I think from that point of view, you know, the only people who could have possibly been disappointed with that speech were hard Brexiteers. Well, no, no, no. Oh, OK, you mean genuinely disappointed as opposed to... I'll tell you the phrase that I'm thinking of, uncrossing my fingers. That speech did not make me uncross my fingers. Well, I, I mean, none of us can uh, can predict what the future is, but you know. Let's, I think you'll find. I think you'll find that I can, Mark. I don't know whether you've been oh. listening to this program for the last few years. Oh, I've been listening to you for a long time, James. Actually, <laughs> I know you've got that crystal ball. I see it on the TV sometimes, but but no, I mean, you know, I I think what what what's um, they, he had to put himself in a position where there was clear blue water between him and the Conservatives, and I and I think and he's he's, he's now where now, Liam Fox was in two thousand and twelve. Well, 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 exactly. But what you have here, let's look at the difference. You have a man who's now leading his party. With Theresa May, you have a leader who's being led. And if, you know, and if that doesn't start helping... No, but he's being led by his party, because he would leave tomorrow, wouldn't he? He'd leave on much stronger terms than... I mean, well, you know, but you'd see you've done it again. Everyone keeps saying clever things, and then someone else comes on and says something clever that is completely contradictory of the last clever thing I heard. So the idea that he will follow the mood, he'll do what he believes is best for the country, led by his party, which explains why Trident is still in situ on the on the policy platform, that I take as an almost uplifting, um, or at least an yes. upbeat analysis, and then you come on and say that he's not being led by his party, he's, he's leading himself, and I say, well, he's not, because if he is, then he's doing the opposite of what he spent 30 years saying he wanted to do. Well, no, 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 hang on, hang on. We I'm hanging, I'm hanging. He, uh, you, you hang very well, I must say. Get um, <laughs> he, he, um, he, you know, he is a Democrat, and, you know, at the end of the day, you know, this, we're talking about a party, you know, you know, as they say, there's no I in team. You know, he, as you just pointed out, with Trident, he hasn't tried to bring, he hasn't tried to bring that down. He's following the will of what his party is saying. What we're, what we're seeing on the other side, unfortunately, with the Conservative Party is Theresa May is following 62 people who could basically uh, okay. her party apart. Yeah, so she's being led by, a, by a, an unrepresentative rump while he's being led by a representative majority. Uh, I, 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 at some point, though, mm. the, the powers that are tearing the Tories apart at the moment, the, 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 the tides and the trends that are tearing the Tories apart, in my opinion... They are inevitable because, as we said yesterday, they are both engaged in a process of damage limitation without being able to admit to large swathes of their own support that, that, that there is damage 
on the horizon. It's Theresa May's... It's the cakeism, isn't it? It's the, the idea that you can have it and eat it and trying to punt down the line the, the bite of reality. The great privilege of opposition is that reality bites later. He can sit and wait for the carnage to be complete on the other side of the house. But then he has to do the same job that they failed to do. He has to somehow step into the breach and provide a path out of this mess that somehow keeps the country united and, and of course, keeps his support on side. I don't think... Can you, can, can you see him doing that at the moment? Well, actually, I think I can. And the reason Really? I you I love can. him, don't you? Well, no, let me explain why. You want to kiss him. You know... I, no, I don't want to kiss him. You want to um, touch? You just have to do. You know, I, 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 you know, I like evidence. Yes. I look at the team. I look at the team round him, and I think he is listening to the team. I don't think he's a dictator really? in his party. Really? Would like to paint him. I'm as seeing dictator. it very differently from you. Well, well, why is he very different? I mean, you. you, well, you I, look I, at I think he's a bossy boots. boots. I think he's quite an old school. I mean, look at the uh, some of the stuff that's been done in his name by some of his supporters within Momentum, not all of them by any stretch of the imagination, but there seems to be a great deal of impatience with dissent and criticism, Mark, no? Well, no, yes, we, we've, we've, heard, we, we've all heard those stories about that, that going on. I, I'm talking about the team immediately re, uh, around him. I mean, if you look at okay. people like Keir Starmer, I don't, I don't think anybody has, no, well, maybe some Conservatives, might have, would have a lot of respect for, for what Keir says. And, you know, and I think there's a balance within... You can't in, in go. I think you've, you've got Diane Abbott on the front bench as well. And while I bow to nobody in my sympathy for the abuse mm. she receives, the, the simple question of competence, though, and, and this notion of blind loyalty from him, another, you could argue argue vestige of, of kind of 1970s hard leftism that once you're in the tent you'll never be put out of it because of loyalty I, I could you vote comfortably for a government that was going to have Diane Abbott in charge of well, I, foreign I think affairs? You underestimated the lady I mean this is the lady who was over a year ago on national TV said will be will be ahead of the polls with the Tories and was she right a year later almost to the day it was in December you, you, you've gone right. too complicated Mark mate you didn't need to do that so when I sit here saying could you really contemplate voting for a government that would have Diane Abbott in charge of foreign affairs you should have just given me a two word answer mate oh yeah you think so yeah well, no I, not those two well, words I, flipping act no Boris Johnson Oh well, yeah, but at the end, well, yeah, Boris Johnson. I mean, which is actually does the same job as the two words you were thinking of. It's ten forty-six. It is in the interests of full disclosure and mild humiliation that I, of course, um, <laughs> remind you that Diane Abbott is the Shadow Home Secretary, not the Foreign and Commonwealth Secretary. I got my Thornberrys and my Abbotts the wrong way round, but the central point stands. I'm just hearing some news from Scotland that Ryanair is to close its base at Glasgow Airport, um, reducing. The number of routes it operates from 23 to 3, five being transferred to Edinburgh. I, I, I mean, they, they mention Brexit, but I don't know that you can, when it comes to Ryanair, take anything at face value, can you? They say it's down to air passenger duty, but also because Brexit is a threat to Scottish tourism and the airline industry. Despite my burnished credentials as a hero of the resistance i'm not i'm not having that sorry ryanair on your jog uh, although we may catch up with our scottish correspondent one of our scottish correspondents later to see if there's more to that story than meets the eye lovely lovely calls today do you think we should do this more often where i just stand here naked covered in sackcloth and ashes it can't be naked if i've got sackcloth on just ashes then and you you come up and sort of spank me with aspidistra leaves because I can't, I don't, I know I'm biased about Corbyn, in a sense. That, that last call and discussion, says Ryle, is worth you reflecting on, James. I thought it revealed the slight bias in your innate distrust of Corbyn. Um, and a lot of you uh, are on that page. People with ears and brains are on that page. People with neither think that I'm some sort of cheerleader for the fella. But yesterday's speech was fascinating because it seemed to me to be the first time he did the thing that everybody said he'd never do. People who were suspicious of his leadership because they thought he'd never prioritise power over principle, if you will. And people who loved him because he'd never prioritised power over principle. This was the twain that would never meet. Yesterday's speech, it seems to me, is allowing people like me to keep our fingers crossed that he is the Obi-Wan Kenobi of, of Remain, while simultaneously not, not scaring the horses, i.e. still being close enough to leave to keep the other element, the 30-odd percent of, of Labour voters, although I bet that's gone down since the last election, to keep them on side. There was one brilliant tweet that came in, and then it was so good it got retweeted, now I've lost it. It's about him sort of playing a waiting game, which ties in with the Theo Usherwood theory, which is, I have to say, challenging my own work at the moment for its prescience and accuracy. David is in Bermondsey. David, what's going on? 
Um, I think he's been playing one degree of difference from the Tories for a very long time. Mm. Look, I'm not as bad as them uh, to keep... Because we're so binary, as we've always been picking out, you choose on one side, you've got all of those voters with you. Yes. And I think the crunch point is now coming where the fudge cannot go on any longer, especially with the amendment that's going to be put down by Anna Subri. I think this is very good politics, personally. I think it could but, but, but when you say dialogue. very good politics, you describe something that in the early days of Corbyn mania, he was lauded for, for, for not being the kind of politician who would ever indulge in what you call very good politics. I don't necessarily think so. I okay. think he's, he's often looked at the evidence and the size of the arguments, and often he's been right, but I think he's also been on a journey like a lot of Labour voters. I was very staunchly remain. Right. But uh, having had a... Uh, I uh, listened to a talk from Keir Starmer basically explaining how many leave seats are with Labour. You cannot go full hog, remain, stay in everything, or else we'll lose all the next elections. However, I think this is a centre point where I think both sides of Labour and surprisingly the amount of Conservatives would settle on it to still go with the vote, but not destroy our economy. So I think there's a lot of people who will back this as a pragmatic way to go forward. <sighs> to go forward to where? Where do we end up, do you think? And, and you don't have to answer that because it's, it's not your job to know because essentially you've said this is a successful holding tactic. A little bit more than a holding tactic. I like that idea of it being one degree west of what the Conservatives are doing. But where does it lead? Where does this course lead? Um, well, I, I was wondering about this, because mm. if they lose the vote in Parliament, the amendment to the bill, and we have to stay in a customs union, what do Liam Fox and all them who've been talking about independent deals do? They can just is ignore that, it, I think. But isn't that a constitutional crisis, if the Parliament says one thing and the executive says another? Um, I, I, well, in the olden days, uh, then, yes, I suppose it would look and smell and walk like a constitutional crisis, but we're, we're living in a world where the Foreign Secretary describes the Irish border as being like the border between Westminster and Camden. I, I, I just think they can... It, it, it's not legislatively binding, is it, that bill? Or rather that no, but amendment? I think that would cause such such troubles to move forward. We're talking about the will so of... So you think it becomes a vote of no confidence, then? Not necessarily, but it could trigger a chain reaction that I don't think Corbyn is meaning to, but could end up changing everything. This story is not over. Well, we know, we, we, we know that. One school of thought, and, and I, I, I'm going to have to sort of concede I may have misunderstood this. I do my best to, to get my head around stuff. One school of thought is that the whips are going to sell it to the Tories, to the potential rebels, as a vote of no confidence. But it isn't, because, of course, under the Parliament Act, you have to, the fixed-term Parliament Act, you can only have a general election if... Parliament votes for a general election. So, if if I, if I've understood everything correctly, you could vote a, for Anna Soubry's amendment, but not vote for a general election. So the Tory rebels could perhaps, at risk of stretching this analogy to breaking point, they could very, 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 very temporarily have their cake and eat it. I think that could be very much happen, and, but I think there'll be so many... But she'll uh, be so weakened. Mog wing. Yeah. Yeah, they'll be weakened, and the mog wing will be like, this is not what we signed up for. Would they roll the dice to install a new leader to try again? I, that's why there's too many variables for anyone to be sure. And that's why what he done... What he done, what have I turned into? What he has done appears to be quite clever, because has he alienated anyone yet? Um, I think he's been going along with the country. I think we were all talking about this, how we should have before the vote, and I think he's been listening to Labour members, voters, and the public. I think the public are majority in favour of staying in a customs union. Well, they, they, the, 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 again, the honest ones are. The, the, the dishonest ones say that they knew all along that we'd be leaving because Project Fear told them, and, and all of the people on their side who told them we wouldn't be leaving, they didn't believe them. They voted for them because they did, because they did believe the other side. This is the Ian Duncan Smith nuggetry that's uh, uh, run around the world at the moment. I, it, I just had a thought there as you were talking that just I just wanted to see if I can grab it. it, it if, if, you, if you set aside the rumps, like the massive extreme fringes, which obviously is, is a, a lot more kind of chuntering and, and crazy on the leave side, but equally there, there are people on the Remain side who probably would be blind to evidence if, if there was any to be blind to. It, 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 what are we going to talk about? 60, 70% in the middle who, who, who do have minds that are changeable, who do have positions that are mutable. He, he hasn't, I don't think, alienated any of them. 
No, I don't think he has. That's quite clever. Because your average person on the street do not want borders under any circumstance. I don't want a border anywhere near us. Oh, you know, come on, mate. You've got to remember the Trump parallels. You can you can whip up a room to start cheering about building a wall, and we like to think we're intellectually and socially superior to those redneck clowns. I'm afraid there is plenty of evidence that we've got our own constituency of redneck clowns in this country being very, very, very well catered for by the mainstream media at the moment. Unfortunately so. I hope it will change one day. And speaking of, so do I. Speaking of Donald Trump, a couple of you from America, notably Jason, saying that the, the conversation that he's been having in, in sort of um, cities, in his case Los Angeles, uh, echoes what we just said about London and Brexit. And the strangest thing about this whole strange saga is that people who the economic projections suggest will suffer the least, uh, i.e. relatively well-paid Southerners, particularly in London, um, speaking up most loudly for the people who will suffer the most, i.e. relatively poorly paid people in neglected parts of the country, notably, you would say, in the north or in parts of Wales. And yet they're the people often shouting the loudest insults at the people who are going to be fine but think we should stop doing this in order to help the people who are going to be hurt. There's something quite emblematic there, isn't there, of the whole sorry story. I